Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Richard, honestly, the book seems not like a book that a foreign policy guy would write. Tell us why you took this on. Miki, I, I, like you all, I go out and talk a lot. And uh, after every talk I give, when the questions start, almost invariably the first question is why, what, what keeps you up at night? What's the biggest oh. challenge? Is it China? Is it Russia? And increasingly, the answer I started giving was, no, it's us. And the answer is, if, if you know, we've learned historically, we can deal with just about any external challenge. We did pretty well the last I checked during World War II and, and the Cold War. But we also were fairly united. And if we're not united, if we don't have the bandwidth to deal with these issues, then we could, we were potentially uh, overwhelmed. So I said, if that's your answer to the question, then the time has come to write that book. So, Richard, I'm, uh, I'm, I remain optimistic about where America is. I think by a lot of measuring sticks, we're doing really well. Uh, childhood poverty down to 60-year lows. Teen pregnancy, 75-year lows. Uh, the dollar uh, strong against other currencies. Our military relative to the rest of the world stronger than ever before. Um, but at, at the same time, there is this, this concern internally uh, that we've gotten ourselves to a point where we're more divided than we need to be. How did we get to this point? It's a really inter interesting question. You're right. There's a big literature uh, about what's called sorting, S-O-R-T-I-N-G, that increasingly, rather than being part of a larger society, we're all living on our mini societies. It might be defined by what social media site we find, the church we go to. Uh, geography matters a lot. There's not as much uh, mobility as, as there used to be, what cable station uh, we watch. But increasingly, Americans have separate experiences. We don't have things like we used to have, say, the draft, where a lot of Americans from different different classes and different geographies would come together and have some have some shared uh, experience. So, you know, I think that has a, a lot to do with our political system, uh, the way we run our primaries, the way we fund our politics. Joe, you don't need me to explain that to you. In many cases, doesn't elect p people who, to put it bluntly, who are prepared to put country, country first. Uh, we don't teach civics in our schools, so I, I don't think there's an understanding of the value of American democracy and what it takes to work. So there's not a single factor, which also means we'll get to it. There's not a single solution, but there's lots of things that account to how we got to where, to where we are. You know, one of the, uh, the 10 habits that you're trying to encourage with this book is to remain civil. So my question to you is, I don't recall another era, another time in my lifetime uh, and in your lifetime uh, where you will hesitate about going to dinner with certain people if they are of an opposing political viewpoint that you know of, uh, because it will not be civil. When did this become so out of control? Yeah, it's happened. Uh, you know, the old thing, it, it's okay to disagree. Don't be disagreeable. Disagreeable. Somewhere along the way, we seem to have have lost that. You know, I'm not sure parents aren't doing certain things. Schools aren't doing certain things like religious authorities have abdicated some of their responsibility. And this, you know, I'm not writing about policy. I don't care what your policy positions are, you're gonna have them. You know, but we've gotta have conversations that are based on facts, one. We've gotta be civil, we have to learn how to disagree. If everything becomes all or nothing, we're gonna end up with nothing. And that increasingly is what's happening in our, in our politics. So I can't exactly say why it's happened, but I think I know how we have to get it back. For example, in classrooms, why don't we have more debates? Why don't we teach young people how to debate, how to, how to both win a debate and lose a debate? That might actually be a good training for a young person. Mm. Well, and, 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 and I've offended half of the audience here that are watching Morning Joe this morning. Let me go ahead and offend the other half. Right. I'll That's give good. a great example that has to do with NFL, Tony Dungy, great former coach, uh, but he, and a great analysis, analyst. Uh, he decided to go to the pro-life march in Washington. Uh, there were columns written about him comparing, uh, you know, everybody at the pro-life march to QAnon, to, to truthers, to January 6th types. No, Tony Dungy, uh, he's, he's talked about his beliefs, he's talked about his faith, and he's pro-life. 40% of Americans, according to the latest Gallup poll, are pro-life. Do we push him to the side of the conversation or do we figure out a way to let a guy uh, have his own beliefs that 40 percent of Americans have as well and still be on TV without catching a lot of crap because he decides he wants to go to a pro-life march? 
I think that's true of all, almost all the issues. I mean, he feels strongly about that. Other people feel just as strongly about a woman's right to choose. Right, take, exactly. If, take the issue you began your show with this morning. There are those who feel that yeah. Second Amendment means there can't be any restrictions whatsoever on their right to acquire this or that gun. Other people say, hey, I've got an absolute right to public safety. So one, how is it we potentially compromise? And I would say it's not just about civility, that's part of it. We've also got to get people who feel strongly to get involved, to get informed and get involved. Right now, I would say groups like the NRA have a disproportionate amount of clout. They're involved in the political process. There's nothing wrong with being involved. But those who feel just as strongly about you know, the other point of view, they also need to get uh, involved. You know, Joe, in my experience, politicians aren't always responsible, but they're always responsive. And if there's political pressures on various sides of an issue, then I think we'll see differences. But take the midterms. More than half the eligible voters in this country didn't bother to vote for whatever reason. Some may be good reasons, maybe bad reasons. But the fact that more than half of the Americans who could have voted didn't vote, that tells me something. There's a lot of scope in this country for more people getting involved, and then they can advocate for whatever political position they think is right. So, Richard, the book, of course, deals with the habits and duties of being a good citizen, a citizen of a democracy. And we've talked a lot on this show in recent years about how our democracy has been more under threat now than any time since the Civil War. Election denialism, January 6th. But you are a foreign policy guy. So as you look around the world and see other governments, does that make you, despite the turmoil at home, more convinced that democracy is the way to go? This has to be how we do this? Oh, absolutely. Authoritarian governments tend to make big mistakes because they don't have people involved in decision making. Once they make a decision, they tend to get locked in. If you, How can a leader admit he's wrong or this or that issue? You don't really have public involvement. So I think we have tremendous innate advantages. But you know, the, the real issue is whether we will operate our democracy in a way that those advantages can come to the fore. So it does mean getting people involved. It does mean correcting uh, our mistakes. It means teaching about our democracy. You know, Joe's an optimist. The old Churchill quote, Americans can be counted on to do the right thing, but only after they've tried everything else. OK, well, we're clearly in the trying everything else phase. <laughs> the only thing I'd say is what January 6th taught me, what the last few years have taught me, is we shouldn't be quite as sanguine as we were. Yeah, you know, we've always come through in the past. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'd like to believe we'll come through in the future. I just don't believe it's automatic. Good things uh -huh. don't automatically happen. Right. So what we actually need are American citizens to get, to get more informed, to get more involved. And yes, then good things will follow. But it won't just happen if we're passive or if we're, if we're inactive. So to... to...